I want to uh, thank all of you, appreciate your patience. There's tremendous traffic, as many of you probably experienced uh, out there tonight. So thank you for, uh, for braving all of that in order to get here. Um, my name is Ben Dworkin. I am the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics. And on behalf of the Rebovich Institute and Ryder University, I want to welcome all of you to what is our final program for this semester. Since September, we have hosted Governor Chris Christie and Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana, Democratic Party leader George Norcross, former DNC chair Howard Dean, and now Mark Melman. Next semester, if you haven't got a program, I just want to emphasize we have a full plate of programs. We're bringing in Assembly Speaker Sheila Oliver, former Governor Jim Florio, U.S. Senator Frank Lautenberg, and Karl Rove, which is obviously uh, a huge thing because he doesn't come through New Jersey to talk at public events uh, often. I urge you, if you are not on our email list, you may well have gotten something in the mail, but if you haven't received an email, that's where we need you to fill out one of those forms in the front. Please uh, do so, so you, we can keep you updated with all of the things we're doing. Programs like this are only possible with the support of you. Tonight, we continue our work to raise the level of political discourse here in New Jersey. Accomplishing great things in politics is always easier if we are all more informed. Tonight, we aim to do just that. Just some ground rules, as is our custom after our presentation from our speaker, when we get to the Q&A section, the first two questions, we want to make sure that we offer them to Ryder students, and then it's open to everyone. Mr. Melman is going to come up in a moment to offer his thoughts on the political landscape heading into 2012, but let me first say how fortunate we are to have him as our guest tonight. It's sometimes hard to appreciate the job that a top-level pollster has. We have all heard the jokes, like how 85% of all statistics are made up. We dismiss the public mood, regardless of what the pollsters find. I mean, who can account for what strikes the American fancy in any given day? We have, as others have noted, it really wasn't that long ago when we were simply swept away by the Macarena. I will admit I was one of them, uh, but nonetheless, so who really cares what the public thinks? We should, and the person we have tonight is the kind of person who understands it better than anyone. Our speaker is not only at the top of his profession because he measures public opinion more accurately than virtually anyone else, but because he offers tangible advice on how to use this information. Mark Melman merges the practical politics on one hand with quantifiable analysis on the other. And in that sense, he represents the essence of what we're trying to do here and trying to build here at the Rebovich Institute, merging the practical politics with real analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming someone who brings it all together, Mark Melman. <laughs> Thank you, Ben, for that very kind introduction. Ben uh, was telling some of the pollster jokes. I will say, you know, my mother talks to her friends, of, as mothers do, about what the, their sons do. And I was explaining their son was a pollster. Her friends said, boy, do I have a sofa for him. So um, <laughs> all kinds of things that we get to, uh, uh, get to work on uh, in our profession. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it was not a great pleasure to come to this traffic, I must say. I spent a lot of time uh, in this area as a student some years ago, and uh, it's great to be back, but I will say that's not a change for the better, uh, the, the uh, increased traffic. Um, but I did want to spend uh, a few minutes talking about the, uh, the political environment as we go into, uh, into 2012, and particularly about the presidential election, and then I'll be happy to take your questions about that or anything else that, uh, that might strike your fancy that I might have something to say about could have something to say about almost anything, but something that's uh, relevant to, to politics, at least in some tangential way. Um, the, uh, the New York Times had a, uh, a, New York Times Magazine, had a story a couple uh, weeks ago uh, by their resident uh, statistician that was headlined with a question mark, is Barack Obama toast? And the implication of, this, of the piece really was pretty much yes, Barack Obama is toast. Uh, that if you look at the political environment, 
If you look at the difficult straits the country is in, if you look at that in the context of, of American history, American political history, that this is a president who is very unlikely to get reelected. That's the, that was the storyline that was in that piece. And indeed, that uh, storyline has been uh, abroad in the land in any number of different venues, any number of different uh, places. Uh, you hear that repeated in, in various ways and in various uh, uh, fashions. What I want to argue this evening, though, is that it's not quite so simple. Uh, that, in fact, President Obama is in a pretty good position to get reelected. In fact, if you look at what is the most broad-based forecasting model around, it's something called Polyvote, if you want to look at it, polyvote.com, that looks at all of the different, uh, a, a wide variety of different ways to think about forecasting an election, and puts them all together, it looks at econometric models, deal with the economy, looks at poll data, uh, it looks at history, it looks at all kinds of, it looks at the uh, political markets where people buy shares uh, based on how likely they think uh, various candidates are to win. If you put, they put all that vote data together and they say that Barack Obama uh, is likely to win with 51.8 percent of the vote. Now, as a partisan Democrat, I can tell you that is way too close for comfort. Nobody kicks back and says, well, 51.8, no problem, we got it won, it's all in the bag. Uh, that's, that's a portends a very close, very hard fought, very difficult, and very contentious race. Uh, note also Ben talked about raising the level of political dialogue. I'm not sure that anything I'm going to say or anything that's going to happen in the course of this campaign over the next year is truly going to raise the level of political dialogue in the country, but that's a different topic, which I'd be happy to discuss, but a different topic uh, uh, than this evening. Um, in any event, uh, it's going to be a very difficult, very hard-fought, very contentious campaign, but you can't sit on the, the plus side of 50 and say toast in the same sentence. Those are just not compatible uh, kinds of, uh, of analyses. So what is it that leads Polyvote, in essence, and me as well, to say it's really the odds are somewhat better than 50-50 uh, that President Obama uh, gets reelected? Um, I am something of a fundamentalist when it comes to presidential politics. That is not a statement of religious conviction. It is a statement about what I think is important in presidential elections, or what's really most important in presidential elections. And those are the fundamentals. It is not the day-to-day -day activity we see. It's not the debate glitch. It's not whether somebody moves too close or moves too far away on the podium at the debate from the audience or from the other candidate. Uh, those things are have a role, those things can be important, but really it's these fundamental structural dynamics that set the context within which the election uh, takes place that are really most important. And I would say based on structure as well as strategy, uh, President Obama has a, uh, a rather good chance of getting reelected. So let me start, start first with some of the structural variables, some of the structural factors that I think port, uh, work positively uh, for the president and for his reelections. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the strategic factors that I think also will matter in the course of this election. Um, first, when we talk about structure uh, and structural dynamics, longevity is important. There is only one president in the last hundred years, the one presidential party, that has been removed from the White House after one party term. It's Jimmy Carter in 1980. Now someone's going to quickly say, what about George Bush's father? George Bush's father was running for a fourth party term, a second personal term, but a fourth party term, two terms of Ronald Reagan, one term of his own, running for a fourth party term. Only one person has been denied a second party term, and that was Jimmy Carter uh, in 1980, who was denied a second party term. And he's the only person in the last 100 years to be denied a second party term. The American public has a fundamental desire to give people a chance two-term chance, at least, uh, to, uh, to get their programs and policies through. People understand that it takes a while to make things happen. Indeed, we've been monitoring this over time. If you ask people in, in public opinion polls, uh, do they think that President Obama created this uh, economic problems that we face today? People say no. Uh, in fact, the most recent poll, 60 percent, said that President Obama did not create but inherited the economic problems that our country faces. Less than 40 percent said he created those problems. And most people will tell you, uh, in polls and, and el in focus groups and elsewhere, people will tell you it's going to take some time to solve these problems. They were a long time in being created. They're going to be a long time in being solved. Now, that's not to say that people absolve him of responsibility. Even though most people say it's not his fault, at a certain point, people can act as, can help but act as if he has some responsibility for those problems. You've been in White House for four, four years. Uh, it does take a toll. Uh, being in charge does matter. But there is a certain predilection that the public has to give people 
a full chance, a complete chance to implement their program, a real opportunity to make the kind of changes that they stood for, make the kind of changes they campaigned on, and that is, works in, uh, in President Obama's uh, favor. Uh, he's only had one, Democrats have only had one party term, he's looking for a second party term, and that is a situation where, again, with one exception, over the last hundred years, uh, people have been reelected. Now, the second sort of underlying dynamic is the one that's probably discussed most of all, and that's the economy. Uh, and there's just no doubt that the, econ the economy uh, and economic performance is a central structural fact that really helps to determine the outcome of presidential elections. Uh, anybody, I think, who's looked at this will, uh, will quickly agree that the data are very clear. There's a, just this very strong relationship between economic performance on the one hand and presidential election outcomes on the other. What is less clear is how to measure this abstraction that we call the economy. Um, what, is, what is the appropriate way to look at that and measure whether or not the economy is good or bad? We can all agree that the economy is bad at the moment uh, uh, in, a general, in general terms. But how we measure this thing we call the economy does matter. So for example, if you look at the relationship between unemployment and presidential outcomes, you'll find that there is none. There is none. Unemployment rates high, low, president's been reelected, president's been tossed out when unemployment is low, they've been reelected when unemployment is high. There just is no real relationship between the level of unemployment on the one hand and how an incumbent party does on the other. Uh, so that's not a very good measurement of the economy. It's an important measurement of the economy in terms of uh, how people are feeling and how people's uh, lives are affected. But in terms of thinking about what the relationship is between the economy on the one hand, economic performance and electoral outcomes, it's just not that, uh, it doesn't reveal that much to us, doesn't tell us that much about what's likely to happen uh, in the election. Indeed, there are hundreds of economic indicators that the, uh, uh, that the federal government tracks. Uh, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of, uh, of uh, St. Louis uh, tracks 50 different uh, ones on their website every day. Uh, it doesn't change every day, but those are their sort of 50 top indicators. There are a whole lot of indicators that one could look at, but some really are better than others. I suggest that unemployment isn't that good. Uh, of an indicator, isn't that strong an indicator? Um, uh, GDP growth, consumer confidence, people talk about, I have a colleague on the Republican side who thinks it's all about consumer confidence. The problem is, again, there just isn't much of a consistent relationship between consumer confidence on the one hand and electoral outcomes on the other. But if you look at the, the scholarly data, if you look at the, uh, the work that's been done by any number of political scientists, several political scientists around the country, what you'll find is that not all economic indicators are created equal. Some really are better than others in terms of measuring the, uh, the political dynamics that flow out of the economy. And there is really a winner here. There is one that variable, there's one economic indicator that tends to be better than the others, and that is uh, change in per capita real disposable income. Now, that sounds very technical, and it is. Uh, it's not something you see plastered on the headlines of the newspaper uh, every week. Tomorrow we're going to have a jobs report that's going to be out there, how many jobs are created and so on. The real disposable income doesn't generate those kind of headlines. Uh, it's not something that people uh, can you know, go to their computers and look up every week. Uh, but it is, a, it is an economic indicator that people feel every time they go to the grocery store and buy the groceries, every time they pull up to the gas station to fill up their tank, Every time they go to pay their bills, they feel what real disposable income is doing. Because what real dis per capita real disposable income tells us is how much money do people have to spend and how much can it buy. And that, again, is not something that people have to read about. It's not something that they have to hear about on TV. It's not even something they have to understand as an economic indicator. It's something that they feel. It's something that they uh, internalize. It's something that motivates them uh, even without knowing what the exact number is. And it's really sort of fascinating that without knowing what the number it is, nonetheless, people can be motivated in very clear ways uh, by relatively small changes in, those, uh, uh, in that variable in uh, uh, change in real disposable income. When Jimmy Carter was the, became the only president to be denied a second party term in the last 100 years, uh, real disposable income declined by about 1%. Declined by about 1%. Indeed, that was the only presidential election since Hoover's in 1932 where there had been a decline in real disposable income, where the growth in real disposable income was negative. Only 1932, 1980, those are the only times that's been the case. Now, the truth is, if you look at the last, uh, the third quarter of this year, uh, that same indicator really declined rather sharply. We actually had another decline in real disposable income on an annualized basis, about 6.6%. 6 
on a, uh, a quarterly basis about a little over one and a half percent decline in real disposable income in the third quarter of uh, 2011. That's one of the reasons that President Obama's approval ratings have gone down in this last quarter. It's one of the most important reasons that his approval ratings have gone down in the last quarter, and it's very clearly associated with this uh, change in real disposable income. In fact, I don't want to overstate this, but I've taken this saying to people that you might even do, since the presidential approval polls come out much more often than does the uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, uh, real disposable income numbers, you can almost predict what's happening with real disposable income based on presidential approval. Uh, because you get the real presidential approval more often, you can sort of tell, well, gee, Obama tank chance, approval tank, chances are real disposable income is down. And in fact, it was uh, for this third quarter of 2011. The silver lining, though, is, uh, is twofold. First of all, in the last month, there was actually an increase in real disposable income. Uh, and because it was so far down, because it was negative in the first quarter, uh, I'm sorry, in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter and on, it's easier to generate more growth. Now, again, we don't know, nobody can say for sure what that number is going to be, what real disposable income growth will be over the course uh, of the next year. Uh, but most of the forecast, current forecasts, uh, have it growing a by a little bit over 1% uh, over the course of the next year. Now, that's hardly stupendous economic growth. It's hardly consistent with winning 49 states, as Ronald Reagan did when real disposable income rose by about 5 or 6% uh, in, his, uh, in his reelection year in 1994. Sorry, in 1994, in uh, 1984. Um, but it is consistent with a president getting reelected. It's not saying for sure a president can get reelected, but that's a level of economic performance that is consistent with reelection. It's about the same level of economic growth, of growth in real disposable income, that we had when Harry Truman beat Dewey. Uh, that was about the same level of economic growth, at least as measured by change in real disposable income. So there is a, a level of economic performance out there that is consistent with President Obama being reelected, even though we're looking at an economy that in many respects, and certainly when the public makes an overall evaluation of the economy, is really quite bad. And indeed, obviously, public opinion about the economy is quite terrible. But, but we are a first uh, derivative nation for the calculus uh, geeks among us. Uh, we care not so much about the level where things are. We care about the change, how things are moving, what direction they're moving in. And what the direction things are moving is in a more positive direction. Uh, is it something people feel yet in dramatic ways? No. Is it something they will feel over the course of next year? Well, enough, I would argue, enough uh, to uh, uh, portend uh, the president's reelection. So those are two structural dynamics. Longevity, uh, one, one party term. Second, economy. And again, it's, uh, the most important economic uh, indicator from a political point of view, change in real disposable income at a level projected to be at a level consistent with the president's reelection. Now, again, I have to warn everyone here, there's no certainties in all of this. Uh, something could happen in Europe uh, that would uh, uh, have it create another recession here. Real disposable income could decline next year. That obviously would affect the president's chances in a very dramatic way. Uh, no way to project that, but based on the projections that we do have, based on current trends, you see it, it, there is an environment, the political environment, economic environment, which I would argue is consistent with the president getting reelected. So what's a third one of those structural variables? Demography. Uh, demography is no longer destiny, uh, but demography still plays a vital role in determining electoral fortunes. Uh, let me sort of summarize the case here very briefly in short, saying, African Americans and Latinos are base Democratic constituencies and are a growing share of the electorate, while white voters are a declining share uh, of the electorate. In 2000, the year 2000, blacks and Hispanics together constituted about 16% of the electorate. In 2008, they constituted about 22% of the electorate. And indeed, in most of the, the key target states over the course of the next year, uh, uh, by the time we get to 2008, the growth is projected to be somewhere between 1% and 4% over what it was in 2004, uh, uh, in 2004, around 2008, thank you. 10, 10, no, 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 8, 8, sorry, 8. My God, I'm so old, all these years that have melded together. But in any event, 2012 is going to be about 1% to 4% higher level of minority vote than we had in 2008. And in 2008, we had 22%. So again, on a national basis, obviously states differ in that respect, uh, but it's likely to be even higher on a national basis. 
The Jewish community, also a much smaller but extremely loyal demographic group as well, in terms of the Democratic Party. The last number of presidential elections, uh, the Jewish community has given somewhere around three quarters of its votes to the, uh, to the Democratic candidate. So if the president repeats his performance among African Americans, does reasonably well by historical standards among Latinos and Jews, he can win with less than 40% of the white vote. Less than 40% of the white vote still enables the president to get a majority of the overall popular vote. Now, how difficult is it for him to get 40% of the white vote? Well, you can argue on the one hand that it, it's pretty difficult. Uh, in fact, if you look at the president's approval rating among white voters these days, it's below 40%. But approval rating is not the same thing as a vote. Uh, and when Democrats were getting creamed uh, in uh, last cycle uh, around the country in congressional elections, uh, we got 40% uh, uh, of the white vote um, as we were getting killed across the country. So even when Democrats were in big trouble in 2010, um, nonetheless, Democrats as a party achieved that 40% of the white vote. The president can win this election getting fewer votes from whites than Democrats did around the country in 2008. Uh, John Kerry, losing the election in 2004, got a higher percentage of the white vote than Barack Obama needs to win in uh, 2012. So demography is important here, and because we have this rising electorate, this rising minority electorate that is disproportionately loyal uh, to the Democratic Party, that structural dynamic, again, tends to favor Democrats, tends to favor uh, President Obama in this instance uh, specifically. So demography is yet another one of these structural dynamics. The final one, uh, or penultimate one, I guess I want to say, I want to focus on is the, um, uh, is the map. Uh, as you all know, this is not a, an election that really is won by popular votes around the country. It's won on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, you need 270 electoral votes uh, to win the White House. Um, the, uh, and that's a number that uh, can be difficult to achieve. Last time, uh, President Obama got the votes in states that will next time, because we had uh, a census in between, uh, the votes, the electoral votes he got last time, the states he won last time, would give him 359 electoral votes this time. That's obviously well more than 270, so he can afford to lose some of those states and still win. Well, the National Journal, uh, one of these sort of insider, very expensive insider Washington publications, has a group of people that, uh, uh, I can't remember what they call them, insiders, I think is what they call them, yes, appropriate for an insider publication like the National Journal, but uh, a group of us that they poll every so often and ask various questions about, uh, make various political projections, and they ask what were the states that Obama was most likely to lose that he won last time? And there are four states that everybody focused on that were most likely, and again, one wouldn't, I, I think it's hard to say that he will lose these states, but we're seen as most likely. Indiana, almost everybody thinks the president's not gonna win Indiana this time. Florida, Ohio, North Carolina. Those are the four states that people said uh, he's most likely to lose. Well, you know what? If he loses those states and wins all the other states he won, he'd still end up with 286 electoral votes, 16 more than he needs to win re-election to the White House. Well, what about Virginia? That's a state that everyone says could be lost as well. Take away Virginia, 273 electoral votes. Still, close race to be sure, poised on the knife's edge, but 273, still enough to win re-election. And I don't think anybody should give up on either North Carolina or Virginia. Those are two states where, again, this rising minority population is going to make those states even more hospitable to Barack Obama in 2012 than they were in 2008. Again, somewhere around 2 3% increase in those states in the minority population that tends to be overwhelmingly loyal uh, to the president. Look at these numbers in a slightly different way. If you look at the, the states that Obama won in 2008, and Kerry won in 2004, so states that have a real consistent history of voting Democratic, that's 246 electoral votes. Below 270, but getting pretty close to 270. What about Bush and McCain? Well, if you look at the states that Republicans have a deep history of winning, they add up to 180 electoral votes, far, far fewer. So again, anything can happen, lots of, lots of uh, campaigning, lots of activity yet to, to happen, but if you look at the map, you would have to say, I think, at the outset that the map tends to favor the president's re-election. It tends to favor the president's re-election because he can afford to lose states that he won in the past and still end up winning the White House. Now, you can't obviously lose 
more than those states uh, and still win. You can't lose uh, uh, Ohio, Florida, North Carolina, uh, Virginia, and Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. I mean, that you know, starts to be real problems. But, uh, and, and look, those are states that are going to be competitive. And nobody should, I think, go into this election saying that a place like Pennsylvania, a place like Wisconsin, places that have been won not just by the last two Democratic presidential candidates, but by the last four or five de or more Democratic presidential candidates, some of those states, too, are going to be extremely competitive. A state like Nevada, uh, which uh, uh, Senator Kerry lost, but President Obama won, trending uh, has the largest increase in minority population over the course of the last four years. Um, so certainly trending in his direction, but Republicans did pretty well in Nevada uh, last cycle, except, uh, except for the top of the ticket, where we were happy to be working for Harry Reid, who won re-election, but uh, and, uh, Demo uh, Republicans won the governor's chair in a fairly overwhelming uh, way. But the reality is that's a state, too, that will be very competitive. So there's a lot of states that beyond those four or five that are going to be very competitive, states that the president could lose. But if you look, ask who has the advantage when it comes to electoral votes, who's more likely to get to 270 based on the history of the map, you'd have to say the president is much more likely to get to 270 than whoever his Republican opponent uh, is going to be. So the map is yet another structural dynamic and one that I think tends to work uh, in the president's favor. Uh, finally, there is partisanship. Um, again, a basic fundamental fact of American political life. Uh, people love to talk about the rise of independent voters, uh, which is really something of a mythology. There are actually fewer independent, true independent voters today uh, than there were in the 70s, but you know, it's not as fun a story, so you don't see it written very often. Um, but uh, that's, the, that's the, the reality. The number of true independent voters is actually quite small, but the fact is about plus or minus 90% of the uh, uh, re Republicans vote for the Republican candidate, 90% plus or minus of the Democrats vote for the Democratic candidate. Independents, those remaining independents, clearly are critically important, but because so many of the Democrats vote for the Democrat and so many of the Republicans vote for the Republican, the partisan balance in the country does make a difference. When George Bush was reelected uh, and beat John Kerry, Republicans had a one-point advantage nationally in terms of party identification. Uh, today, uh, and when, uh, when, John, when uh, President Obama won uh, last time around, it was about an eight-point uh, advantage in party identification for Democrats. Um, today, we don't have that kind of advantage, but most of the polls these days, so somewhere between a four and six point Democratic advantage in terms of party identification. So the partisanship also tends to work in Democrats' favor, not as strongly as it has in 2012, but again, we don't need to win 359 electoral votes. Uh, we only have to win 270 uh, to get uh, the president reelected. So uh, again, the, uh, the uh, partisanship as another structural dynamic also tends to uh, work uh, for the president and again, suggest that he has a pretty decent likelihood of getting reelected. Let me mention one other uh, semi-structural variable. It's not really as structural as the others, um, but is not really strategic either, so I don't have a good place to put it. I'll just put it here in the middle as I transition from the structural to the strategic. And that's people's feelings about these candidates. Uh, they are subject to change, and they do change significantly over time. They can change significantly over time. But the candidates that we're looking at now have gotten a lot of attention over the course of the last uh, several months. They'll get more attention, and again, these opinions can change. But if you look at where we are today, the president has a tremendous advantage over all of these Republican candidates in terms of people's fundamental attitudes uh, towards him. Uh, if you look at the latest polling, 52% of Americans have a favorable attitude toward the president. That's sort of basic gut, in, uh, gut impression, uh, not an approved, disapprove of his performance, but how do they feel about him as a person? It's their sort of emotional connection, emotional valence, 52% favorable, 45% unfavorable. Now, those are not great numbers by any stretch of the imagination. We tell our clients you want to have a two-to-one ratio of favorables to unfavorables, but that's pretty close to one-to-one, -one, so that's nothing to really cheer about. The only thing that makes it encouraging is to look at the Republicans. Um, who are really much worse off. So if you look at Mitt Romney, the most popular of the Republicans, his favorable unfavorable is 36% favorable to 42% unfavorable. So more people have an unfavorable view of Mitt Romney in this country than have a favorable view of Mitt Romney. Looked at differently, President's uh, uh, favorables are about 16 points higher than Romney's. Uh, his unfavorables are about three points higher uh, than Romney. So uh, 
pretty close on the unfavorable, the president has a big advantage in terms of favorables. Now, more people come to know Romney. They may all turn out to like him, uh, the people that don't know him yet. But that's really relatively unlikely, because the people that don't know Romney, or the people less likely to know Romney, are more likely to be Democrats. The people who know Romney are more likely to be Republicans. So the truth is, it's not very likely that Romney's going to all of a sudden develop an improved position just as he becomes better known. Though I will say, there is a magic to winning elections uh, that does ter transform images. And so if Romney wins in Iowa and wins in New Hampshire and starts winning all these primaries, he's going to look like a lot better person to people. And when he mounts that rostrum, uh, uh, to, if he does, mount that rostrum to become the Republican nominee uh, in, uh, in Minneapolis in, in 2012, uh, people will look at him in a whole different way. There's nothing that really changes one's image quite so much as being a major party nominee for president. Uh, that does tend to, re to readjust people's attitudes. So again, that's, I'm not, I don't want to argue this is a structural dynamic that's sort of in place in some sort of permanent uh, etched way, but it is, I think, an indicator of the difficulty that Republicans face. And Romney's the most popular of the Republican candidates. Look at the rest of the field. There's Newt Gingrich, who's now challenging uh, Romney for the nomination. He's at 31 favorable, 48 percent unfavorable. So his favorables are, uh, uh, are 21 points lower than the president's. He, Newt Gingrich has more people who don't like him than don't like Barack Obama. I mean, just think about that for a second. Newt Gingrich mostly, you know, wasn't, people haven't been thinking about the guy for a couple decades for the most part. More people don't like him than don't like Barack Obama. And then, of course, you go down the list and you look at, say, uh, Herman Cain, you know, 29 to, to uh, uh, 56. You look at uh, uh, Perry, uh, 25 to 50. Uh, you know, we can only, I as a Democrat, can only hope that these people actually do get the nomination. Um, but the truth is, they're unlikely to get the nomination because everybody dislikes them. Even Republicans dislike them. So that makes it much more difficult for them to, to become the nominees. But they're certainly much less popular than the president is. But again, even Romney, Gingrich are really a lot less well liked than the president, and that puts him in a uh, relatively better position uh, going into 2012. So those are the structural and the non and the semi-structural uh, facts about the election that I think tend to uh, redound to the president's credit and tend to suggest that he's far from toast. In fact, the odds are, are really better than even. What about the strategic factors? And I really want to focus on, on three here, one on the negative side and uh, for the president's point of view, uh, two on the negative side for the uh, for Romney, I'm going to focus on Romney because he seems to be the most both the most likely nominee on the one hand and the one that poses the greatest difficulty uh, in most people's minds uh, for the president. Now, the, the, the strategic uh, challenge, it's not really a challenge, the strategic uh, objective of the Romney campaign is really going to be to focus people's attention on what's wrong with the country. A relatively easy task, uh, truth be told. Uh, when things are bad, telling people that things are bad doesn't get a lot of resistance. It's a pretty easy case to make, uh, and it's likely that Romney will relentlessly focus on how bad things are, how bad they are in the economy, how bad they are in other arenas, and will obviously try and put the blame for that on the president. Uh, again, as I said before, people don't really blame the president uh, at this point for the economic uh, situation we face. But as I also said, at some point, people can't help but act as if he has some, bears some important responsibility for the economic straits that we're in. That's the fundamental strategy of the Romney campaign. It's really no secret. It's really not uh, very difficult to discern. And uh, it's one that, in other circumstances, has worked. It certainly worked for Ronald Reagan uh, in 1980, trying to defeat uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, talked relentlessly about the economy, made it famous with that question, are you better off than you were four years ago? Uh, almost nobody would answer that question in the affirmative today. Uh, very few have answered in the affirmative in 1980, hence Jimmy Carter lost. Um, but that's going to be the strategy of the Romney campaign. The, the, I think the uh, Obama campaign has two strategic areas in which to look that are going to be very, very important and I think very devastating for Romney. One of which has already been the subject of some discussion, the other has really not. The one that's been the subject of discussion so far is, is flip-flopping. Um, and this is uh, really already fairly well known, but uh, Mitt Romney is a guy, and without trying to be partisan here, just stating a fact, uh, Mitt Romney has changed his position on any number of important uh, and core issues over time. Um, this is a man who every day 
faces the, has to go around the country denouncing his own most important accomplishment as governor of Massachusetts. I mean, think about that. What he did was to get health care reform, it's really the same health care reform more or less, that was passed nationally. He has to go around the country saying that what I did in Massachusetts was really pretty bad. It may have been okay for Massachusetts, but it's terrible for the country. Now, and that's literally what he says. He has yet to explain why something could be great for Massachusetts and bad for everyone else. And it's a really sort of his hard explanation. But in any event, um, it's just indicative of the kind of changes that he's made. This is a guy who campaigned against Ted Kennedy for the United States Senate, saying Ted Kennedy was weak on gay rights, that he, Mitt Romney, was going to stand up for gay rights in a way that Ted Kennedy had not. Uh, so he was going to out, uh, out gay rights Ted Kennedy. Now, of course, he is uh, uh, totally to the right on gay rights, uh, gun issues, global warming issues, uh, all kinds of other issues that on which he has had really overwhelming and huge changes of direction. And I would just say parenthetically, he's not the only one where that's true. Uh, Newt Gingrich has also had this uh, same problem. Few people remember, but at the, uh, uh, when uh, Nancy Pelosi first became Speaker of the House uh, a few years ago, uh, she and Newt Gingrich appeared together in a national television advertisement where Newt Gingrich talked about the importance of doing something, uh, really doing cap and trade to deal with the problem of global warming. Now he doesn't believe global warming exists. Then he was on TV talking about the importance of doing something about global warming and working with Nancy Pelosi to get it done. So a lot of these folks have changed some pretty fundamental positions uh, pretty much on a dime, but Romney really does have sort of a pride of place as a flip-flopper because he's just got such a long list of issues on which he has changed his position. And that is an issue in the Republican uh, nominating process. It's why the Republicans have been so reluctant, particularly conservative Republicans, have been so reluctant to get behind him. And indeed, again, parenthetically, if you look at the poll data, we've seen this really bizarre pattern this year where we've had these surges. I mean, first it was Donald Trump and, and then Michelle Bachman and Perry and Kane and uh, now Gingrich. The only person who hasn't surged in all this is Mitt Romney. If you look at Mitt Romney's poll numbers, other than in the state of, in, among Republican primary voters, other than the state of Massachusetts, he's been between sort of 22 and 26 percent of the vote nonstop. People have zoomed ahead of him. They've fallen behind him. He hasn't grown. Now, that tells you something. It tells you that people don't want to vote for Mitt Romney. They'd like to find almost anybody else, a pizza guy, a dis, you know, disgraced former Speaker of the House, anybody. But Mitt, they can get excited about it, at least for a while, at least till they find out what the problems are with that individual. Then they abandoned them. Uh, but they still don't go to Romney. They're looking for the next person. So, the, and the fundament, one of the fundamental reasons for this is in, in the Republican primary electorate, there is a basic mistrust of, uh, of Mitt Romney's positions. And I can tell you in my own experience, I've talked to people who worked with him in the administration in Massachusetts who say to me, I can tell you the day the day, almost the hour that he decided to run for national office, because that was the hour and the day when all these positions started to change. And it was clear and it was evident to everybody that was around him. It was clear and evident to everybody that worked with him. And it's clear and evident to the press. And it's clear and evident on the record that he has had many changes in position. Now, the truth is the American public understands that people can change their position. A lot of us have changed positions on various issues over time. One or two, and you can have a good explanation of why you've changed your position. Um, Romney's got too many, and he doesn't have any good explanations. It's really hard to explain why you were for gay rights, and now you're against it. It's really hard to explain why you were, did want to do something about global warming, and now you don't think it exists. It's really hard to explain why you thought the Massachusetts health care plan was a good idea, and now you think it, it's not. Those are really hard sort of evolutions to, uh, to explain, and there are just too many of them. So that's one, again, one core strategic area in which the Obama campaign is going to attack Romney, and one that the American people, I think we've seen in past elections, has been very sensitive to, and one I think is going to make it very difficult for him. But I don't think it's the most important flaw that he has. I don't think it's the most important strategic thrust that the Obama campaign is going to have. It's the one they're on now. The most important strategic thrust, I think, is going to go back to the economic issue. Uh, and this is really uh, comes from work, uh, the, the part that we did for uh, uh, Je Jennifer Granholm, was a former governor of Michigan, um, and later for Barbara Boxer. But Jennifer Granholm faced a very similar kind of situation that uh, President Obama faces in, in some respects. Uh, Michigan was then the leading edge of the recession when she was trying to get reelected. Um, uh, highest unemployment in the country. Indeed, at that point, the Republicans talked about a one-state recession. The only state in the country that was having a recession was Michigan. Tens of thousands, 
almost hundreds of thousands of auto workers thrown out of their jobs. The state's in, in, in terrible uh, economic uh, situation, people moving out, businesses closing, houses uh, being foreclosed on. All the things that we see now were there in Michigan a few years before at the time when Jennifer Granholm was running for re-election. And uh, we had the same number of people, 70 odd percent, saying the state was seriously off on the wrong track, as now say the country is seriously off on the wrong track. We had more people saying the economy was in bad shape in Michigan than now say the national economy is in bad shape, if you can believe it. So the fact is it was a very similar, uh, if anything, slightly worse situation. And our opponent was a guy who was a businessman, like Mitt Romney, who was spent $70 million of his own money uh, to get reelected. That's a hefty sum anywhere, even by New Jersey standards. It's a hefty sum of one's own money to spend. And certainly by Michigan standards, it's a very, very hefty sum of money uh, to put up to try and win a, uh, an, uh, a governor's race. Um, what we found in Michigan, what we then found in, uh, for Barbara Boxer, who was running against uh, Carly Fiorina for Senate in the last cycle, is that if there is a cardinal sin in this economy, if there is a cardinal sin in this economy, it is cutting jobs in America and creating jobs overseas. That is what Dick DeVos, Jennifer Granholm's opponent, did. He cut jobs, he was the Amway guy, he cut jobs at Amway in America, and he created jobs in China. It's what Carly Fiorina did as the CEO of HP, cut jobs in America, created jobs in China and Europe, other parts of the world. And it's what Mitt Romney had did for 20 years at Bain Capital. That is what Mitt Romney did as a businessman over and over and over again. And so people are going to ask themselves, do I really want a president who is not only not going to cure these economic problems, who is the economic problem? Because what America, rightly or wrongly, the American public believes that the problem with our economy is that businesses are not any longer loyal to this country, not any longer loyal to their communities and loyal to their workers. They're in search of the fastest buck, the quickest dollar, and they're willing to pack up and move and go to the cheapest place to produce. And that is the fundamental diagnosis that the American public has of the economy. And Mitt Romney will be seen as the prime or a prime exemplar of that problem. He will not be the solution. He will be the problem by the time November 2012 comes around. And so President Obama has to meet a certain threshold in terms of dealing with the economy, and that's going to be very difficult. But people, I think, voters are going to look at Mitt Romney and say, again, not, he is not the solution. He is the problem uh, with our economy. And that, I think, is going to be the most important weakness that he has. It's going to end up being, in my view, the most important strategic thrust uh, that the Obama campaign is going to take as we get uh, closer to excuse me, as we get closer to election 2012. So, in short, we have a series of structural factors that tend to be really very important in determining ca campaign outcomes. We talked about the economy, we talked about longevity, uh, we talked about demography, we talked about the map, we talked about uh, partisanship, we talked about attitudes toward the candidate. All of those factors tend to favor the president, none of them very strongly, none of them with, with uh, tremendous certainty except Longevity, that's the one thing that we know is not going to be the case. The president will only be running for a second party term. Nothing can change that uh, over the course of the next uh, year, but everything else can change to some extent, uh, the state of the economy and so on. Um, we talked about those factors which all at least marginally favor the president, some favor him to a greater extent, uh, and we talked about some strategic factors that I think also in the net favor the president. So you put all that together, and I think you have to look at, at 2012, as I said at the outset, as a very difficult, very competitive, very contentious, very uncertain race, but one where the president's odds are much better, not are better than the odds of the Republicans, and where if you look at that poly vote forecast that I mentioned at the outset and say the president's going to win with about 52 percent of the vote, that's a pretty close race, but you put all the factors together as we sit here today, that's not a bad forecast for how this election is going to come out, and that is certainly not toast. So let me stop there and see if folks have questions or discussion. I'll let, uh, I'll, I'll let Mr. Melman take a question. Students, first. We've got one. That's the credit, Mr. Melman. Uh, <laughs> Mike, you got, we have two people with microphones. Anybody? Thank you. Hello.
Hello. Um, Hi. My question is, can you elaborate more on the reasons as to why the 40% that you spoke about earlier find President Barack Obama responsible for our economic crisis? Sure. Um, I, let me say at the outset, obviously I disagree with them, okay? So I, I'm, I'm with the 60% who don't. But this is really, two things are going on here. One is just being there which is to say he's the president, he's in charge, things are not going well, and people can't help, some people can't help but naturally say, if you're in charge and things aren't going well, it must be your fault. Um, it's what happens to coaches, uh, it, uh, you know, basketball coaches and football coaches, uh, when they're not other circumstances that are <laughs> causing them to be looked upon negatively, but when they're losing games, people say, oh, it's the coach's fault, let's get a new coach. Um, even if it's not really their fault, they're in charge, and so people can't help but hold them responsible. CEOs, just happen, that's what happens in the world. There's a second factor, though, that we should, that should not overlook. There are a significant number of people who believe that the president's stimulus pro program actually was hurt the economy. Again, it's an argument that I do not accept, it's one I disagree with, but there is a segment of the public that believes that part of the problem we have, important part of the economic problem we have, is overspending, and that this president, through the stimulus and through other programs and projects, contributed mightily, in their view, to that overspending. And so they look at the stimulus and say, it was a huge waste of money, in their view, Money was spent, jobs were not created. They look around and say, where are the jobs if jobs were created? That's not exactly a scientific way to do the analysis, but that's the intuitive way that people do it. And so they say, debt went up, that hurts our country, jobs weren't created, therefore a bad policy which actually hurt the economy and helps to make the president responsible, in their view, for the economic circumstances we face. Thank you. Um, Looking at all these different trends, um, if you could create like a perfect candidate, what are some trends that you would pick? Perfect candidate for Republican or Democrat? Um, if one didn't exist, just um, well, yeah. okay, it's a, it's a good question. That, you know, if you think about sort of what the fundamental trends are in the public mood right now, they care about the economy deeply. They hate Washington and they hate politics. Um, so you'd want somebody who has experience creating jobs, but not creating them overseas, creating them here at home, and someone who is not from, from politics. And in fact, you know, we, we uh, did a race for, uh, also happened to be in Michigan, for a guy named Dave Bing, who some people of my age may remember as a basketball player, uh, probably the great, one of the greatest basketball players of all times, who, by the way, told me he never made more than $40,000 a year playing basketball. Think about that. The, one of the greatest basketball players of all time never made more than 40 grand a year playing basketball. <laughs> Can't get that in the NBA today to like, you know, carry the water. But <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly right. So, but anyway, Dave Bing was a guy who, since leaving basketball, had built a, a business in Detroit, very successful business, employed a lot of people, created jobs, was certainly not a politician. And that was basically the stance he took running for mayor against an incumbent is, I'm not a politician, I'm not beholden to any of these special interests, I'm not gonna play these political games, I'm a business guy who's created jobs, I did it in the private sector, I'm gonna do it for you and get you out of this mess, and it's really what got him elected. In many ways, that's sort of the, the ideal type for these times, but when you get into sort of big business, if you will, like, like uh, 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 Mitt Romney, you're in a situation where some of these, or, or uh, uh, Carly Fiorina was, or Meg Whitman, uh, in California, where some of these things don't quite work because the, the way in which they did their business was not really focused on the community, not really focused on the country, but had enough international aspects that people lop over to become, as I said before, become the problem instead of the solution. Oh, go ahead. I can hear you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, you made the comparison to football coaches and basketball coaches with the president and the importance and the impact that each position has. And as you were saying that, I was thinking of uh, trying to like relate it. Herman Cain, where you're in, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I was trying to relate it to uh, something that goes on, like the Philadelphia Eagles or even the Jets or the Giants, something that could relate to people that the success of the team comes and goes with the coach. Everybody's in love with Rex Ryan. Now that they're six and five, they're not, and they want to get rid of him. So what does that tell you based off that 
it's up to the players to catch the ball. It's up to the running back to run the ball in the end zone. It's up to the defender to tackle the quarterback instead of run, letting him run in for a touchdown. So the my point my point is what I wanted to ask is that I'm trying to form this in a question is that um, just end with a rising inflection. Yeah, <laughs> what I'm saying is that everybody in this room should realize that. You're, you're as much as mortal as Barack Obama or Mitt Romney is, and you're as much as important to America or to your beliefs as that person is, and you shouldn't put so much power. I, I can organize a, a session right now and give for 50 minutes to talk about you, the person, same way I could do it about Barack Obama. So, I mean, how much importance do you feel that the president has? And more importantly, what do you think about, I feel, America's us versus them? approach to basically every problem we have in this country. Okay, well, uh, a number of important questions there, some of which are above my pay grade. So let me, uh, l let me focus on two, of, two pieces of it. One, um, th there is an us versus them sort of mentality, which tends to happen when there are pressures. Uh, when people feel external pressures of some kind, whether it's the economy or whether it's uh, uh, terrorism or war, whatever the, the external pressures might be, people tend to divide the world into us and them. The 1% versus the 99%, the us versus the, the terrorists, whoever it might be, you know, th that the natural human tendency is to, to divide into an us and them because it's the easiest way for people to sort of relate to what's going on, to explain to themselves what's going on, and to choose up teams. And as you say, you know, what's the difference between, you know, we guys move from one team to another, they put on a shirt, and all of a sudden they hate the guys they were playing with you know, a few weeks before because they put on a different shirt. That's even, you know, less us versus them than a lot of the other things that sort of animate uh, our politics these days. So that us versus them mentality is there. Is that a positive thing? Probably not. Is it a natural thing? Yes. Uh, and so that's just the world in which we live. Um, in terms of the importance of the presidency, um, I agree with you 100% that the president is not responsible, in fact, for everything by any stretch of the imagination. And look, our, our founding, our founders really set up a system that was designed to prevent things from getting done. I mean, we all, everybody complains things aren't getting done, but that, that's how the system was designed. I mean, the founders designed a system like that. The rule makers in the Senate made it even tougher to get things done. That was their goal, that was their purpose, was to make it difficult to get things done. I mean, you have to have two different houses of Congress agree on the exact same bill and the president agree. I mean, that's just by definition really difficult um, and a lot more difficult than, say, a parliamentary system where you just have to have the people in charge agree and everyone else has to follow or they, they lose their job. So in any event, it, it, we're, the president doesn't have the kind of control that people think. The president doesn't control the economy, yet people do hold him responsible. And indeed, there, there's evidence that suggests people, not directly, but in fact hold the president responsible for the weather. You know, that if, if there's bad things going on in the weather, people think less well of the president. Um, even though nobody, if you ask people in a poll, is the president responsible for the weather, they'd say, of course not. But they can't help but hold somebody who's in charge in a big way responsible for whatever's going on. So even though the president is not, in fact, able to affect everything, nonetheless, people hold him responsible. Now, none of that's to say that the president doesn't ha isn't very influential in our system. I think the president is very influential. And I think it makes a bit, to me, I think it makes a big difference who the next president is. Uh, my own view, again, speaking personally, I think the country is at a, is at a, a very fundamental crossroads at this right now, although I think you can look back at every election in the last maybe 50 years and hear, have someone say it's a crossroads, but this time it's really true. Um, we are at a crossroads. Um, you, know, you know, you look at the history of empires, and we are something of an empire, different from empires of the past, but you know, there's nothing permanent about it. And I think some of the, the Republicans who believe in sort of uh, American exceptionalism, an extreme view of American exceptionalism, believe that, that American exceptionalism is a God-given guarantee. And so that, you know, it just, it's not, no matter what we do, we can default on our debt and still be the number one economy and the number one country in the world because we're sort of guaranteed by some divine right to be an empire and be number one forever. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so it, it never has worked that way historically. It's not working that way now. Um, the, uh, the choices that we make in this very difficult period, I think, really will determine whether we continue to be the world leader or we tend end up being England, which is, you know, not a bad place. Um, but 
they're not what they were uh, once upon a time. Yeah. I'd like to know, I'm concerned about my great, great, great grandchildren having to pay all those trillions of dollars that we're in debt for right now. And the president borrowed trillions from China, a communist country. I asked Congressman Chris Smith, what was the bill number that he used to borrow that money? He says there was no bill number. I said, he did that on his own? He said, yeah. I said, he violated the Constitution. He broke the law. I said, you should impeach him. He said, that's not easy. He and, and making excuses instead of doing the job for the people that elect them. See, that, it's nice to look good, but he's not looking very good over all those other characters. Well, I appreciate the point. And look, I, I think that, the, as I tried to suggest before, I think the debt is a serious issue. Um, you know, again, I'm not an economist, and, and it, it sort of goes beyond my uh, uh, area of expertise. But I will say this, uh, the president didn't borrow any money. The president doesn't borrow money. Uh, that's not how the system works. He doesn't go to China and say, please give us some, some money. Uh, not at all how the system works. T-bills are auctioned off. Anybody can come buy them. You can come and buy them. China can come and buy them if they want. And China came and buy them. And China came and bought them because they had the money, and we don't. And part of the reason they have the money and we don't is because they've been cheating for years uh, in terms of their currency and their currency valuation. And the truth is administrations, Democrat and Republican, over recent years have been reluctant to take them on in a direct way. And that's a shame in my, from my perspective. But in any event, that's really the, the place we are. It, it, it's not the president borrowing money, but the country is going into debt. And a lot of that debt is owned by China, and that is very problematic. The number one holder of debt, of American debt, is the American people, however. The largest creditor uh, to the United States government are the people of the United States, not just your great, great, great grandchildren, but you and you and all of us. We're the prime debtors, uh, prime creditors of the American government. Go around there. Yeah. As you know, uh, Obama um, did not carry two very important groups last time. Uh, the white vote, particularly white males, and people over the age of 65. To what extent is that attributed to something I guess we don't like to talk about because it makes us uncomfortable? I'm talking about the racial factor. Uh, and do you see that as playing a, a, a role? The fact that, uh, as they used to say in the 1930s, that man in the White House, how many Americans say that N-word man in the White House? The racial factor. Right. Well, it's an excellent question to which no one knows the answer. Let me start there, okay? So the, but here, there have been any number of serious, well done, well crafted academic studies, some of which suggest it was a marginal problem for the president, some of which suggest it was no problem at all, and some of which suggest it was a marginal benefit. So, Somewhere between marginal harm and marginal benefit is probably the right answer, which is not all that very interesting. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the sort of biggest number that you hear out there from these studies is around three points. Um, three points, the president did three points less well uh, than he would have had he been white in, in similar circumstances. So that's probably the high end of harm. Uh, that's bad. You know, I mean, nobody should you know, think that that's a good thing, uh, but that's probably the high end. The low end is, is that it might have been a, 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 a some help. My own view is that it works differently in different places. There are clearly some places that it worked less well. Uh, that it was less well. Let me give you an example. I, I, um, this is not off the record, so I, I declined here, but let me just put it this way. It is, I don't think it's an accident that there were two states where Barack Obama did less well than John Kerry. One of them was Louisiana, one of them was Arkansas. I don't think that's really just like an accident, okay? I think there's a reason for that. Um, and, uh, uh, and the reason is, as you suggest, I think has to do with race. So 
there clearly are, and in other places, I think it made less of a difference. Um, so uh, hard to know exactly, but it would be foolish for anyone to stand up and say there is no racism in this country, that the president is not uh, uh, subjected to uh, the same kind of racial stereotyping that uh, other ordinary Americans are as well. Of course he is. Oh, yeah. Well, no, and that's why I say, when I say careful studies have been done, the, the ones that ask people, are you going to vote for him or against him because he's black, uh, those I pay no attention to, whatever. Um, but except in one respect, which is to say th there, what you can learn from that is that, that at least people understand that racism is no longer socially acceptable. There was a time when people said, yes, I would be less likely to vote for someone who's black. Now they, now they don't say that. Well, that doesn't tell you that they are less likely to vote, that they're not any, more, any longer less likely to vote for someone who's black. It's that they recognize it's not a good thing to say. Contrast that with Mormonism, where people still say, yes, I'm less likely to vote for someone who's a Mormon, which is to say anti-Mormon prejudice is still socially acceptable. Thank you very much, Mr. Mellon. It's a uh, pleasure to have you here. You give a wonderful summary. Um, I'm honored. Uh, you give a wonderful talk. You're very honest and articulate. And if you don't mind, I'd like to put you on the spot a little bit. You're so sharp in your analysis. I'd be very grateful if you could help me defeat a 31-year Republican incumbent uh -huh. uh, who, like or Mitt Romney, is quite a flip-flopper. So I, I have my card. Okay. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Sure. Sure. Pleasure. That was an easy question. Here we go. Thank you. Um, you would spoken about several topics, including the importance of um, the Electoral College vote, uh -huh. uh, demography, and um, I think those are the two main ones. I was wondering if the presidential approval ratings and disapproval ratings that you found through your studies uh, varied based on region, uh, if the South you know, swung one way more than the North did, or if the, the Northeast was different than the Southwest, uh, and if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. Um, well. There are, there are two things that happen simultaneously, and it's hard for, I think, sometimes for people to keep the, the, the simultaneity, simultaneity in mind. People move together, and they move differently, which is to say, when the president was at 70% approval at the beginning of his administration, and now he's at 45, let's call it, 43, 45% approval. Well, in the course of that downward movement, a lot of different groups are moving down. Some aren't. African Americans have moved down only a little bit. Whites have moved down a lot more. So, you know, there's some variation, but almost everybody's moving to some extent because the circumstances are different. He comes in as a newly elected president. Everybody's very proud. We've elected the first Amer African American president. He's going to make all these changes. Uh, the economy's going to get better magically overnight. We're going to end two wars. This is really great stuff. And then, wait a second, two weeks later, that hasn't happened. So we start to get a little disappointed, and those numbers start to slide. Okay. So, but that happens to everybody to some extent. But it happens differentially. Some groups tend to be more opposed. Some groups tend to be more supportive. And, and you know, the demographic groups that tend to be most loyal uh, towards uh, this president and towards Democrats in general uh, tend to be the, the, the natural sort of partisan ideological groups, Democrats and liberals. Uh, from a demographic point of view, uh, they tend to be uh, 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 minorities. They tend to be... Um, uh, uh, within the white community, college educated as opposed to non-college educated whites, and particularly whites who have uh, uh, advanced degrees beyond college, those tend to be the most positive folks. Non-college educated whites tend to be groups who are, uh, tend to be a group that's much less positive toward the president. So if you look around, and Southerners tend to be less positive uh, than North, Midwest, and, and, uh, and West. Uh, and so the, the question then becomes, sort of in any given place, what's the mix of those people? Um, you know, in Louisiana, you have a lot of African Americans. You also have a lot of non-college educated whites, and you're in the South. So you're going to get a lower approval rating than, say, in California, where you have a lot of minorities and fewer whites, and you have a much higher proportion among those whites of college educated whites. So you get a much more positive view of the president in a place like California, because you have a different mix of demographics. But that view of the president in California and in Louisiana is still worse today than it was in January of uh, 2008 when he, or 2009 when he took office. Yeah. I think you got my question. Um, speaking to your first year experience as a Democrat, it seems to me the common knowledge that Mr. Ray just did Democrats to lose. In other words, the people who came out four years ago or three and a half years ago 
thank you, were, were, are the ones that are not going to come out this time around. And it seems to me part of the problem is, is the problems that Democrats have with messaging and staying lockstep with the points that we want to get across. Will you speak to that from a Democratic mindset? Why is that in comparison to the Republicans? Where they're very easily, this is what this is what our, our talking point is going to be, and this is what the truth is, and this is what we're going to say five times until everyone believes it, and you say it five times in the Democratic Party, and no one believes it. Well, let me make two points. First, it's a criticism that that I hear, and, and there there is some validity to it. I'm going to speak to that validity in a moment. But before I get to the validity part, think I want to just point to the to, to the invalidity part of it, which is to say, the invalid part of it, which is to say, if you go to a Republican meeting, as I've actually done, um, you will find them saying exactly the same thing. Why are those Democrats always on message, always saying the same thing, and we are always all over the place, we can't agree on anything, we have these dumb policies that we end up with, How, why in God's name are we talking about ending Medicare, whose stupid idea was that, you know, and why aren't we, you know, we should have been just talking about Obama, how, what a bad job he was doing, so, you know, so they, they have the same argument among themselves, criticize each other for, for the same thing that we criticize ourselves for and look at them and say, oh, they're marching in lockstep. So it's not quite as, uh, the, the difference, I would argue, is not quite as dramatic as it might appear. However, there is some difference, in my view, I, so it's the, the valid part, and I think that the, the, there are a, a couple of reasons for it. Um, one uh, is that uh, we are, by nature, a less hierarchical party. Um, partly that has to do with the way, uh, partly has to do with the way the party is actually organized and structured. Uh, but partly it also has to do with the sort of ideological commitments of the party. Uh, they're more authoritarian or more uh, anti-authoritarian. And so, I mean, I've sat in these meetings with members of Congress where, <laughs> I mean, I, over and over again over the years where they said, okay, well, let's try and summarize our values, like in two or three. And you can't do it because you put two or three and everyone says, yeah, but you got to have this too. And then you got to have that too. You gotta have the eighth one too, because you can't. And well, no, I don't. That eighth one, I don't agree with that. You know, and you, you just can't get there because you really don't get everyone to agree on very short, brief, fundamental statements of sort of what we're about. In the way Republicans can say we're for lower taxes and a strong defense. I mean, that's you know very simply what Republicans are for, and they're very able, to, apt to say that over and over again. And we can't get people to agree on that because they don't fundamentally agree on uh, at that level of detail. Um, we don't have, and we don't have the same, as I said before, we don't have the same level of discipline, uh, I think, about those things uh, that they do. What tends to enforce that discipline is a president who is popular. So when the president is popular, everybody falls in line behind the president, says whatever the president says. When the president becomes less popular, people say, well, <laughs> he's not so smart. You know, he, maybe what he's saying isn't the right thing. So I got something different to say. He should be saying something different, because if he said what I'd be, what I'm saying, he'd be really popular. So, uh, and everyone's, you know, got their own ideas. So when the president becomes less popular, you get this even greater cacophony of voices out there. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Hello. Um, hello. Earlier you spoke of demographics that traditionally vote Democratic, these demographics being Jewish, Latino, and black peoples. Uh -huh. Is there any factors or scenarios that you can think of that would make these voters vote Republican? And if so, how do you think that would impact President Obama's reelection? Mm -hmm. Well, and the, the truth is that the three most loyal constituencies to Democrats uh, over the last several elections have been black Jew, blacks, Jews, and gays. Latinos a little bit less so. Um, in point of fact, in either of those other three groups, but Latinos still, you know, very important part of the coalition and very large, uh, 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 very large numbers of voting for Democrats. Are the things that can move those communities? The answer is different for different communities. Is there anything that's going to move the African American community at this point away from President Obama? I think the answer is no. Uh, there are people that talk about it. The idea is put on the table. Uh, you know, there are activists in the African American community who say oh, it's going to happen for all kinds of reasons. At the end of the day, I just don't believe it. I don't think there's any real likelihood of, uh, of the African-American community uh, moving away from President Obama in particular, or even from the Democratic Party at large. So very un that's the mo community that's most unlikely uh, to move. Um, the gay community is a little bit more complicated because clearly on gay rights issues, the Democrats are fundamentally sympathetic, and the Republicans are not just unsympathetic, but anti. 
And so part of the way Republicans are, are proving their bona fides as conservatives is by engaging in some level of gay bashing. And that ought to move the, the, the gay community very strong, keep the gay community very strongly in the Democratic column. And I think that's the, it is most likely to do that. But there are some cross-cutting cleavages in the gay community that most important have to be economic. Um, and so there are, you know, gays in, in, in this country who say, you know what, I'm living my life. I don't care about the rights issues. I, I do care about the economy and whether I'm gonna, my taxes are going to go up. And, you know, that matters to me more than what their position is on gay rights. And so you can get some movement. But that's the community that I think is sort of uh, in some ways second least likely uh, to move. Latinos and Jews are, are different, uh, uh, slightly different segment. Um, Latino community, I think there is a substantial swing vote in the Latino community. Um, on the, and to my amazement, and I will say, confess, my amazement, we recently did a survey of the Latino community for Univision. I would have thought that most Latinos would have, would have said that the Republicans were unfairly scapegoating Latinos in the course of this immigration debate. That is not, that is a majority position. It is not an overwhelming position. It's not 70 or 80. I would have thought 70, 80 percent of Latinos would have taken that view. That's not the case. Um, so there are, it is, not, it is not the case that, let me put it differently, many Latinos do not perceive the Republican Party to be as anti-Latino as I perceive the Republican Party to be. Um, let me put it that way. And so that leaves open the possibility for a swing vote in the Latino community and understand also that Latinos have some problems with Democrats uh, on immigration to some extent. Uh, Democrats promised immigration reform, haven't delivered. Uh, Democrats promised a lot of things for the community, haven't necessarily delivered. And that's a potential area of problem. Um, the economic issues are important. Education issues are important. Um, and, but the Latino community is also ideologically a somewhat more conservative community when it comes to social issues and the like. Most people are not voting, most people in that community are not voting on those social issues, but they are more conservative on those social issues, so the potential for a larger uh, uh, swing vote in the Latino community exists. When it comes to Jews, um, an even more complicated picture in some ways, but there are sort of domestic policy considerations and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, foreign policy, Israel considerations, and there has been small movement away from the president because of Israel issues, but it is relatively very small, and so you're still going to have a, a very strong Jewish vote for the president. We need to end it there. I'm sorry, folks. I know there are other questions. Uh, we can grab them on the way out, but I want to thank Mark Feldman. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Out of there. Oh, no, no. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Please have a very happy and healthy holiday season, and if you wanted to grab Mr. Melman on the way because you didn't get to ask another question, now's the chance. <laughs>